Our scripture reading for this service is taken from Micah, the book of Micah, chapter 6 and verse 8. Micah 6, 8. I'll give you a few seconds so you can look it up. Micah 6, 8 says, He has shown you, O men, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading. Amen. When uh, Pastor Bob asked me to have the sermon today, I was not unprepared. I had the opportunity to share with you one of my favorite texts. I'm sure that each one of you have a favorite text. And um, I chose Micah 6, 8. And uh, after studying the test and working on this sermon, I found out a lot more than I ever anticipated. But the, stand, the, the text, is, it's always helpful to understand this text in context. So I'm going to provide some background information. There's a time in the history of Israel where sin ruled a nation. In the first few chapters of Micah, there were practices in Micah's time that were really, really sinful. Okay. The uh, first few chapters are filled with examples of the ruling class exploiting the lower class. You know, judges could easily be bribed. Priests were involved in unholy practices and there were false prophets. Bigotry, cheating, oppression, scams, intolerance, violence, prejudice. This all took place in Micah's time and come to think of it, it sort of reminds us of our society today. I don't think our society is that much different, but we can say that sin polluted every level of society and, and Micah exposes these Israel's sins and announces God's indictment against his people. And the result of their and consequences of their evil ways, their kingdom will be overthrown. Then Micah moves into a message of hope of how Israel will be restored and how justice will be established. He continues and talks about God's pleas for repentance of Israel. This sort of sounds like the three angels' messages in Revelations 14 where the people on earth are called out of Babylon because they're living in a very confused state of mind and action. And then in chapter 6 of Micah, he sees a court scene so that Israel could hear the complaint that the Lord has against them. This is God talking. I want to hear your testimony of what I've done wrong to you. He says, it was me who brought you out of Egypt where you've been captive for 400 years. It was me who gave you God-fearing leaders to lead you out of the promised land. It was me who caused Balaam to curse you, to bless you instead of cursing you as you paid to do. And he says, you know, I can never be persuaded to curse my people. And those 40,000 young men that were killed in one night as, as a result of sexual immorality and idolatry. And there's this pause. And Israel says, Lord, you know, how can we lessen your anger? How can we convince you to ease up. What, what do you want from us? You know, should we bring in more tithes into the storehouse? Should we give more to your favorite charity? Yeah. What do you want from us? And please, God, be reasonable. 
And God replies and says, it's not a mystery of what I want from you. I've shown you. And by the way, it's not complicated. That's sort of a long introduction to Micah 6.8. To do justly. Many of you know that I help refugees prepare for their test to become citizens. And several of the questions in this test deal with our justice system. And I have a good friend who speaks very good English. She speaks Nepalese. And through her, I explain to her how the justice system works. And it's to create a fair and just society and the laws apply to everyone. One of the questions that deal with justice is, what is the rule of law? Does anybody know the answer? The rule, the answer is, no one is above the law. The law applies to everybody. So in order to help our society to do justly, we cannot judge according to appearance, ethnic origin, gender, sexual preference, nationality, age, religion, and if we do break the law, there are consequences to pay. In other words, you break the law, there's punishment. It's sort of like an eye for an eye. This kind of Punishment, when the punishment fits the crime, it's called retributive justice. Let me give you an example of retributive justice. We have laws in Missouri that regulate the maximum speed, safe speed on the roads and highways. And if we get caught breaking the speed, uh, the speed limit, it demands that justice be served. Sometimes there's fines. Some, there are points that are assessed against your driving record, and if the severity is big enough, they'll take your license away. That's a pretty good example of retributive justice. There's another example that I can tell you about, and in Missouri, we have something called the Castle Doctrine. Is anybody familiar with the Castle Doctrine? I see a few hands. This doctrine allows you to carry out justice in a situation where you can use force, including deadly force, against an intruder. And it almost holds you free from legal process, prosecution for the consequence of the force used. Deadly force may be justified if the person reasonably fears imminent death or great bodily harm to him, to herself, or to another. I hope that nobody ever has to invoke the castle doctrines. But our society is a just society, and um, we abide by it. There's punishment for breaking the laws. I want to read a text out of Deuteronomy 32.4 that talks about our God in reference to justice. He is the rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. In Psalms 89.14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. These texts clearly announce that we have a God of justice. How many believe our God is a God of justice? God has penalties for breaking his laws as well. If you read through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, there are violations worthy of death. Let me, let me read you, to you some of these violations. Cursing a parent. Kidnapping. Worshipping a false god. Breaking the Sabbath. 
bestiality, sorcery, desecrating a sacrifice, murder, rape, incest, cursing God, false prophecy, disagreeing with God's judgment. These are all violations of his laws with the penalties of death. Do you think God is fair in dealings with man? I believe he is. We know a God that our God is a God that does not change. God will do what he says he will do. That's why it's so important that the call goes out, to, to heed the call that goes out in the three angels' message in Revelation 14. Those who do not partake of God's forgiveness or his mercy will suffer the consequences of these actions, of their actions. When God asks you and I to do justly, we're called to live differently than the world. We are called to restorative justice. Restorative justice is a practice that seeks to repair the harm done by criminal behavior. Vastly different from retributive justice. For example, early last year, I think it was in March, somebody broke into our shed and stole the mower. Okay. Retributive justice calls for that person to jail time and a fine, okay? Restorative just, justice calls for that person to write a written apology, replacement of the mower, and repairs to the shed. Let me give you another example. If I, if I intentionally um, ridiculed or said some racial slurs to a, to a, a minority, Restorative justice may ask me to raise awareness of hate crimes by setting up a panel and having address hate crimes. Restorative justice is a hard work because it asks us to do whatever it takes to mend broken relationship. So how do we know that God is talking about this type of justice, restorative justice. He summarized it in one very simple precept. It's called the golden rule. This is the, not the new golden rule where if you have the gold, you make the rules. It's the old golden rule that says, therefore, whatever you want man to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And in Isaiah 117, he says, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. You know, the, the golden rule applies to us, especially in a Christian fellowship, because if we want people to love us and they want we want people to reach out to us. According to the golden rule, we need to love them and reach out to them first. It can only be done if you have God's love in your heart and if you have love for fellow man. And I'm gonna go on a limb, but I think the golden rule is a universal rule. I think you can find the golden rule applied in, he, in People who are heathens, people who are Jewish, people who are Christians. It's not just to our culture. I think it's universal. And if people would live their lives according to the golden rule, I think there would be justice for all. To love mercy. <clears throat> How many of you have heard about mercy in our society? 
Mercy, you hear about mercy in our society. You read it sometimes a little bit in a newspaper and through all sorts of media. Well, I dare say it doesn't happen very often. And some say it's even on the way out. It's not talked about very much. It's not exercised very much. But when it is exercised, it's really appreciated. When you get the time, when you get some time, there's an example of a judge on YouTube who extends mercy to people who are guilty of class D misdemeanors. His name is Frank Caprio. You can Google in some time. When you see the videos which have gone viral overnight, you can really appreciate mercy. Another way of looking at mercy is to forgive someone who has done you wrong. I'm going to tell you a little story what happened during World War II. In December of 1943, there was a German ace pilot named Hans Stiegler. He had positioned himself behind a B-17 bomber and there was no way, there was, he had every reason to shoot this bomber down because earlier in the war, a bombing run had killed his brothers. Okay. And uh, now they're bombing German cities. Not only that, if Hans Stiegler took down this particular bomber, he would round out his kill score and he would be awarded the German equivalent of the Medal of Honor. So, <clears throat> as Stigler was prepared to shoot this bomber down, he, he, he was sort of quizzed because the bomber wasn't shooting back at him. And so he positioned himself a little bit closer behind this bomber and he noticed that the gunner had been killed. And the, most of the crew on this B-17 bomber had been injured as well. And he knew that if he shot this plate down, he'd just be killing people in cold blood. So what did he do? He opted to do the honorable thing. <clears throat> he flew next to the, the bomber and indicated to the American pilot who was beyond belief that he was going to escort him west to the North Sea. Then he flew very, very close to this B-17 bomber so that it would not be targeted by anti-aircraft. And when they approached the North Sea, he pulled up next to the B-17, saluted him, and was on his way. It took Charles Brown, the aviator of this B-17 bomber, 50 years to track down Hans Stiegler. And when they finally connected, they became best friends. As a matter of fact, at the reunion in 1993, Hans Stiegler was the guest of honor and each one of the crewmen showed Hans videos and photographs of their children, videos of their grandchildren, people that would have never lived if it wasn't for Hans Stiegler's mercy. There's a Bible example of mercy that is almost astounding in parents. You wanna teach your kids about mercy you might think about this condensed story that I will tell. In Genesis 35 through Genesis 40, there's a story about a boy who was bullied by his brothers, scolded by his fathers. The Bible stated the brothers hated him because he was envied by his father. The Bible says the brothers could not speak peaceably to him. And after he shared his first dream, 
the escalation of hatred for Joseph when even went higher. After the second dream, the Bible said that brothers hated him even more. After the third dream, his dad jumped in and said, you shouldn't be talking like this. Why do you, this is out of bounds. The brothers hated him even more. Well, you know the story. The boy was sent out to check upon his brothers. They found him in the valley of Shechem. Uh, the brothers connived to said, let's kill him. Uh, God intervened and he was sold as a slave. And how a famine caused the brothers to seek food where jo Joseph was second in command to the king and how his family was re reunited. And this is the point that I want to bring home. The Bible states that in the process of restoring himself to his family, Joseph cried multiple times, multiple times. I think you'll find whenever you exercise mercy to somebody who has done you wrong, I think you'll find that it brings you closer to God because you get a glimpse of the mercy that God extends to you and you and you to everybody. Jesus had really strong words against those who do not exercise mercy. He called them hypocrites. In Matthew 23, 23, I'm reading, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. In essence, what he's saying you should not neglect tithing at the expense of mercy or justice, nor should you neglect mercy and justice at the expense of tithing. You know, mercy and justice, <clears throat> when we talk about this, we can often say, well, what is more important, mercy or justice? You know, and this could be an endless conversation. But where it really matters is in the final judgment. The mercy, the significance of mercy can be understood in James 2.13. For judgment, this is talking about the final judgment, is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We know that mercy is equal to justice because the principle is equal. But in the judgment, there will be two groups of people. Those who have been merciful and those who have not. We know that God will be impartial in the judgment but the Bible says that he will have mercy on those who have shown mercy to others and those who have not extended mercy to the others will have judgments pronounced against them. It almost seems like that mercy and justice will come into conflict, but according to James 2.13, mercy will prevail. This, my friends, is the plan of redemption. Walk humbly with thy God. When Kathy and I first started doing things together in the year 2000, we would often go on very long walks. Okay. You would find us more often on trails in the woods around Longview Lake than on the plaza. And we'd be gone for hours at a time. And after we were married, 
on March 29, 4 o'clock, 2003, <laughs> we would go on backpacking trips by ourselves or with Bob and Angie. We would head to California, to Colorado, to Wyoming, where we often hiked seven to 10 miles a day, carrying everything we needed to live on the trail for five to seven days. These times, in a group, or just the two of us, strengthened our friendship. We talked about life. Kathy would sing for me. We made joint decisions. We encouraged each other. When the trail became difficult, we helped and trusted each other so that our walk, our hike, our adventure would be successful in every aspect. And in this process of walking together, our relationship deepened. Genesis 6 tells a story about Noah and how he walked with God. Genesis 17 tells the story of how Abram walked with God. But the first person in the Bible to have walked with God was Enoch. In his walk, Enoch pursued God and learned how to commune with him in every facet of life. And he did so for over a third of a millennium. And God was so pleased with Enoch that he decided to make an example of him. And he took him to heaven so they could enjoy each other's company. God make Enoch an example of all, to all generations, how pleased he is with people that walk with him. Now, it's God's decision who he will invite to go to heaven with him, but in the meantime, while you continue to walk with him, he will reveal himself to you through his word in ways that are unmeasurable. And something else really unique happens when you walk humbly with God. He becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And you become, in your eyes, smaller, 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 and smaller. You know, I can't help but think that on the gravestones of Abraham and Noah, the inscription would include, he walked humbly with God. So, walking is, in the Bible, with God is a symbol of relationship. In much the same way, Jesus wants us to walk with him. I found a text in 1 John 5.12 that in one sentence summarizes what relationship really is. In the text read, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Well, what does that mean, he who has the Son? Well, the easiest way I can explain that is I have a wife. She's sitting right over there. Okay. I talk with her, she talks with me, we do things together. Three essentials of a relationship. To do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God, doesn't really make sense in the world we live in. First of all, God's justice is not the world's justice. And mercy, although not often seen or practiced in a world of retributive judgment, is the, where retributive judgment is demanded, is vastly different from restorative judge, judgment. We know what we read in James that mercy is equal to justice, but mercy will prevail in the final judgment. And walking humbly with God is not the world's way of life. If our role as Christians is to reflect the character of Jesus, then if we lived according to these three simple principles, people would begin to see Jesus in us. 
Thank you.